Good morning and welcome to The Review. Guys, this is the Instagram Live show where Kanama news, culture, and stories are shared over the warmth of coffee. Today's episode, we are joined by Eric Voss, the owner and founder of DA Origins, Da Origins Kendama, an Austrian Kendama brand that is really, honestly, super, super cool. Guys, if you haven't been following me along for a little bit now and you're, you're new, I've been on a bit of a European Kendama kick. I've been watching all the edits from Kendama France. I've been watching all the stuff from Native Kendama, from the European squad like Tio. Guys, they're just so cool. I want to be their friends. I want to just get to know them. And so today, I'm super excited to bring Eric on the show and chat with him about his brand that he's built that has a really unique take on Kendama, where it's all about going back to the origins, where everything came from. So I'm super excited for it. Uh, we are having a good morning this morning. I brewed a fresh cup of coffee for this episode, and we're just happy to be here. Guys, we are in season two, episode 15 as well. It's a wonderful place to be. Uh, before we do get Eric on here, guys, I want to say a couple thank yous. Uh, we have been going live for almost a year long now. We're on episode, I think, 45 or somewhere around there. We've almost hit 52 weeks, and I feel like I want to do something special in a couple weeks on that 52nd week. We're coming up to it. So if you guys got any ideas, hit me up in the DMs for a one-year anniversary episode or something to do there. Uh, I, need some, I need some inspiration. Secondly, uh, I want to say that there's actually this cool thing going on, and I'm just going to pull it up on my monitor here because I'm forgetting what it's called, but there is a big coffee event happening worldwide that you can participate on if you're a coffee enthusiast like me, and I'm considering entering into this. It might be, uh, it might be a little out of my budget at the moment, but we're, we're going we're gonna to take a look at it. If you guys have your Instagram and you want to look this up afterwards, go to Leaderboard Coffee. Basically what this is, is it's a game, uh, basically virtually created for you to taste test different coffees and try and identify their origins. This company is going to send you out 10 packs of coffee that are all roasted differently, that are all from different origins, and you basically submit your response to each of the cups. You have a full season long, it's like a couple months to taste them, review them, and submit your answers, and the winner gets like $1,600 worth of stuff. Uh, there's like an espresso machine, there's a bunch of coffee, and a whole bunch of other good stuff that comes with that winning. So I've been looking into this, I'm considering doing it, I'm definitely not going to win it, but to get 10 free co or 10 coffees for like 75 bucks is actually pretty good. It's not a bad deal. Okay. With all that said, I also want to know, what are you drinking this morning? Like I said, I brewed a fresh cup of AeroPress. We are drinking an Ethiopian from Phil and Seb's, the same one that I had last week. So what are you guys drinking this morning? Alongside that, as you let me know, I want to remind you guys that if you are a big fan of this show and you've enjoyed the journey that we've been on and you want to be a part of that journey and help support the continuous growth of it, uh, we do have a Patreon. And that Patreon is a $5 a month subscription that allows you to get behind the scenes access to pretty much everything that's going on in the review. I write kind of vulnerable blog posts in there, what I'm going through, all that kind of stuff. And if you really want to get behind the scenes and see the data and all that good stuff, then uh, go ahead and subscribe. I would love to see you there. I'll give you a nice warm hello. Plus, you get added to my close friend story, which admittedly I haven't been as active on this past week. So let's see what you guys are drinking this morning. We got Pats underscore 48 drinking air. We got Flurry Mac plays Dama. Sadly, no coffee, but he's got some Mountain Dew Voltage right on. Brett Walters with the Nitro Cold Brew and two shots. Two shots of espresso. Let's go. Uh, Starbucks iced coffee from Crispy. G Fuel from Carter Justice grinding for that sponsorship. And Blue Cheese with the water. I love to see it. Guys, let's get Eric on here and let's dive into this week's episode of The Review right now and let's dive in mm. eric yo welcome here thank you very much i'm very glad to be here I'm, hey man no i'm i'm glad you're here with me this is awesome name another uh, possible situation where i could be on a video call with someone from austria this is this is this is legit it's quite impossible. <laughs> I know. 20 years ago, I would have had to get a flight and fly over there. And then, and then we'd have to set all this stuff up. But no, we just DM back and forth and we say, hey, let's do it. Let's do it. Now we're sitting here. <laughs> Absolutely. Eric, how's your day going? Uh, it's been pretty fine, actually. The weather yeah. is nice outside. I've been chilling the whole day, to be honest. Yeah. What, what time is it for you? You're in Austria. I'm assuming it's not the morning for you. No, 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 no. It's 7 p.m. 7 p.m. So, okay, so I'm going to ask, and, and uh, what, what are you drinking today? 
I actually brewed up some coffee. But, Did you actually? Uh, yeah, but I don't. But I don't like uh, like hot coffee in the afternoon. Yeah, I only drink hot coffee in the morning. So I think I brewed it like an hour ago, and now I got some got some cold coffee on me with almond milk. Oh my goodness, that's awesome! That is <laughs> so good. Right on. So, your is Austria home for you? Is that where you've always been? Yes. Okay, super cool. We'll, we'll dive into a little bit of your origin story, because ultimately that's what we're going through today. We are learning about Da Origins, uh, your Kendama brand that you started, uh, DAO. Everybody pronounces it so differently. So I want to know from you, first <laughs> off, how, how, are, how am I supposed to say your brand's name? So basically, it's Da O. Da O, okay. Yeah. But the full name would be Da Origins, right? Yeah, Da O is like a short term for Da Origins. Yeah, uh, like way, way in the be way in the beginning, um, the idea behind it was to create something that we all shout on uh, Kendama events, and that's like the expression when we're all in joy at a oh. freestyle event or anything, because everybody goes, "Oh, you know." Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's sick. I didn't even <laughs> think that. Because I would say, I, I went on a little dive through your YouTube edits that you had on YouTube. And I, I saw your, your origin story of, of Dao on there. And, and you were talking about how the whole brand is designed to really dive deep into the origins of Kendama building, you know, making a Kendama. The sourcing yeah. of the wood, the paint, the craft, everything is all about going back to the roots of it, which I thought was just fascinating in general, because we live in a day where a lot of the companies out there are outsourcing their Kendama manufacturing to China. They don't necessarily know where their wood's coming from. They don't maybe know, you know, how the painting process works or all those sorts of things. But, but you wanted to get really intimate with it and really dive into it. And I think that's cool. It was that was kind of uh, the most important thing for me to know where everything comes from and if it may be dangerous for some things to put on a kendama, especially when you lick the bevel and everything yeah. behind it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I suppose, you know, when kendama uh, companies originally probably started creating kendamas, no one was thinking, oh, someone's going to stick their tongue in there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like five years ago, nobody did that. Yeah, it was taboo to do that, but now everybody's doing it. So on honestly, I'm sure there's types of woods out there and I'm sure there's paint out there that we probably don't want to be uh, sticking so close to our mouth. And, and you might be the guy to tell us a little bit about that as we as we dive in. But before we before we get too deep into that conversation, I always like to ask a couple of warm up questions. I want to know, uh, first off, we already asked what you're drinking. But secondly, I want to know if you could teach anyone their first spike, past or present, who would it be? Poof. It's a tough one. Yeah, it's a tough one, but I probably would go with uh, with uh, one of my favorite artists, and it would be Shaheem. Shaheem? Okay, what yeah. what kind of artist is Shaheem? Like musical? Uh, he's a rapper. He started his rapper career pretty early, like he was 13 or 14 when he released his first album. So okay. he was one of those boy rappers back in the day. Basically, yeah. basically he just rapped... Um, songs which were written for him i think from rissa and chissa and all those guys from the wu-tang clan oh but yeah 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 i really enjoy this kind of music and i would be pretty hyped to show this guy back in the day how to spike it that's awesome yeah. <laughs> that's so cool i think uh pie down in the chat said lil dicky you know another rapper there all the different <laughs> yeah. rappers are i mean it would be a privilege to share a kendama with anyone honestly like for me Anytime anyone comes up to me and they're like, what is that? I'm like, this is my favorite moment of the day when someone asks me, what is this? Because <laughs> yeah, I can yeah, finally yeah. like show them, teach them. They've opened the door to learning. And I love that so much. Okay, uh, one more question. And then we're, we're going to dive into, a f I I'm, I'm really excited for this conversation. I'm excited to jump into your origin story, the origin of Dao, and, and talk a little bit about the Austrian Kendama scene. Because I don't think I know anyone else from Austria that plays Kendama. So it's kind of wild to me to think that, you know, there's this thriving company that's started by this guy out there that <laughs> it has this clout behind it as being just an infamous Kanama brand that creates these beautiful Kanamas. So we're going to dive into that. But before we do, I want to know who is the most inspiring player to you today? Today or? Yeah, today. Whatever? Just today. You know, like, who is someone that you really look up to right now? That's a hard question as well. Like the, the 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 past few months, I didn't really play that much. Like I have been, you know. I was 
I was traveling a lot and a lot of competition, so I had to play, you know, and I really enjoyed mm -hmm. to play. But when you're like isolated and cannot really like go somewhere, a player I look up to. I would go for, I don't really know his real name, but <laughs> his Instagram tag is JC Cancastle. Oh, yeah, uh, Justin Clement. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. oh, <laughs> Justin's awesome. He has such good flow. Oh, my That's goodness. That's what I mean, like, um, in space walks and stuff. Yeah. Uh, stuff you can do with shorter strings are pretty underrated by now. But yeah, I, well, really, I, I really look up to this guy when he pulls the trick or just go on his feet and w watch him flow. It's really and nice. He, and he looks like he has so much fun doing it, right? Yeah. Uh, and and I, I have to apologize. The chat was calling me out. They're like, you don't know who Mr. Flox is? Of course I know who Mr. Flox is. Everybody knows who he is. You but should know by now. <laughs> yeah. I, is he from Austria as well? He's, he's basically from my hometown. From oh, okay. As well. I just didn't know where he was from, guys. I know who he is. <laughs> okay, Eric, I am so excited for this. Uh, it is not always uh, the, I don't always get the opportunity to chat with people on the other side of the world. So I want to learn as much as I possibly can in the next hour and a bit as we, we got you here. Uh, but before, before we do, I uh, want to remind those of you that are tuning in in the chat uh, that you can participate in this conversation as well. This is a live call. Uh, between Eric and I, and you can put in some questions down in the Q&A tool. That's the best way to get your questions asked in today's episode. If you were ahead of the game and you put them on the post ahead of time, I already got them in the show notes and we're ready to rock on them. So guys, let's dive into this week's brew view. So Eric, take me back in time uh, before Dama. I want to know, uh, who are you? Like, if you were to describe yourself to, to someone who just, you know, wanted to get to know you, how would you how would you describe yourself? I'm just a just a normal random guy, to be honest. I was, no, 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 no. You own a Kendama brand. You got to have something. What? Tell, tell me about you. What, what hobbies did you have outside of Kendama? I like to. Well, I I have been riding BMX and I also skated back in the day. But it all it all went pretty slow when I started my apprenticeship as a chef. Yo, you were a chef? Yes. Do you still cook? Like, no. is what? I stopped oh. because of because of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no way. Okay, talk talk to me about that real quick. There's three things there to, to unpack a little bit. BMX. A, I love BMX. That was what I did pre Dama. I wasn't yeah. like insanely good at it. And then I dislocated my elbow uh, riding, and so that's kind of what really accelerated my economic career because I couldn't ride anymore for for like a year. Uh, but you you were into BMX. What what got you into BMX? Um, I did a little bit of dirt biking, like 24 inches dirt bikes with just one brake on it. And we had like a dirt trail or we still have it here. And I was enjoying that pretty much. And then we kind of switched to, to street riding and that's where I switched to BMX and also brake less. So yeah, I was, did you ride park or did you mostly ride dirt jumps? Um, I started doing dirt jumps and then uh, mo mostly street and park riding. Actually. Okay. Yeah. I, so when I was in college, I went to this like small liberal arts college in the middle of Saskatchewan. It was flat as heck. Like there are no hills, no nothing. Yeah. There, the park, uh, there was like a local skate park, like 20 minutes away from where we lived and a dirt jump park that was terrible. Like another, you know, also about 20 minutes away. <laughs> and, and so I was like, you know what, screw it. I'm going to build my own jump. So I found this like tree line near oh, where my college was. And I just went out there one day with a shovel. There was one jump in there. And over the four years, uh, you know, that I had started digging and building these jumps four, five, it might've been five years. We yeah. just built this line of dirt jumps and slowly grew them every year. And it was so fun. Like, that takes me back to probably some of the most fun I've ever had in my life was digging and riding my BMX on some dirt jumps in the middle of trees. It was euphoric, like so fun. Yeah. Uh, so do you still ride a lot then? Um, the last time I rode the BMX was like two or three months ago and I had a flat tire after it. So I put <laughs> it down in the basement again. I, I still did not repair it. Mm. But every, every like... Oh, one or two months, I I decide to ride a little bit. And and do you prefer one style of riding? You were saying you like park and you like street. 
Uh, but would you, do you do other kind of riding? Do you do like downhill mountain biking, slope style, stuff like that? No. No. Uh, I you got kind of like I have been, I have been at uh, the slope style park once and it was really, really a lot of fun. Yeah. But I just couldn't afford the bike back in oh, the day because they're it's so expensive. So expensive. Yeah. Oh my. <laughs> so I, there, have you been to Canada before, Eric? No. Okay, so if you ever come to Canada, uh, and if you come hang out with me, and you come in the summer, we're gonna go. We're gonna go downhill mountain biking together. And uh, there's a couple of hills near where we live. But if you go into Kelowna and you drive a little bit north of Kelowna to uh, Vernon, there's a mountain there called Silver Star. And Silver right. Star is just so good. They used to host World Cup races there. It, it's just a really nice hill. Oh man, the most fun I've ever had in my life was riding bikes out there. And the crazy thing is out there, like, like you were saying, bikes, downhill bikes are so expensive. You see guys driving around in downtown Kelowna in beaters of a car that are like $400 with a $9,000 bike on top of it. It's like, yeah. it's a totally backwards world out there. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. So, okay. So you were BMXing, you were skating and you were, you were going to be a chef. You, yeah. you got your apprenticeship in, in cooking. Tell me about that. I mean, I was always fascinated by by cooking. Like, what I can think of is I wanted to have like pudding, and it was already late at night, and I was like, I was like ten ten years old or nine mm -hmm. years old, and my mom would not make me one. So <laughs> I took the biggest pot out of the cupboard and just turned it around so I could reach the stove, and I just made it myself. And you just started cooking and, and, and it just started. I started cooking and I really enjoyed it. And that, that was the plan pretty much to, to, um, to go through the nine years of school you have to do here in Austria and then start the apprenticeship. You do nine years of cooking school? No, no, no. It's, it's like ground school. And oh, okay. I was like, yeah. you have to go to school for... Dude, you guys <laughs> no, must no. have dang good food. Nine years yeah, to learn how to cook. Yeah. It was three years of apprenticeship, and after that, I was kind of freestyling it. Yeah. I worked on caterings. I worked for a company that does catering for, for concerts and festivals and stuff like that. I also worked in a five-star hotel. After that, I, <laughs> I, I moved back home to up Austria, and I started to cook in, a, in just a normal restaurant, and I really enjoyed that as well. That's awesome. Man, that's so cool. I, I don't know if you've listened to much of the show before, but when uh, Rhea Smith was on a couple weeks back, uh, we were talking about it as well uh, because we, we both also, well, I, I wanted to become a, a chef as well. Mm -hmm. So I originally was going to go into culinary school after I graduated. I thought about doing it. And, and what turned me off from it was it's a lot of work that you have to put in, like in terms of hours. You become a chef, you, you're up early and you stay late. And you just deal with complaints all day of people not liking what you make, even though they just have bad taste and you're just, you know, you know whatever it is, you know, you can come with a million reasons, but it's like an exhausting job and you don't get paid that much unless you really climb the ladder or you own your own restaurant, you do yeah. well. It's a, it's a hard industry. It is, it is. And I just wasn't cut out for it. I wasn't tough enough, but, but okay. So, <laughs> so you, you were cooking for a little bit and you were BMXing, you were skating. That was what your life looked like. How old were you at the time when, when all this was happening before Kendama? Um, I started the apprenticeship at 15. 15 years, oh, okay. Yeah, I have, I have been cooking for about seven, seven or eight years. Wow, that's crazy. So yeah. you, do you still like cooking? Do you still enjoy yeah, doing yeah, it? Yeah, a lot. Yeah. Well, what's mean, your favorite? I mean, I really like the, the the, the way of cooking uh, when I was working for the catering company because I was my own boss in the end, you know, mm -hmm. I had to prepare them um, breakfast, lunch and dinner. So I had to work full day, but it was worth it in the end. I met Steve Purple. I showed, I showed a German rapper how the Kanama works. I also gifted it to him. It was it was really, really a lot of fun. Then I also did, did work for a restaurant, which was like one Michelin star. But yeah. I didn't really like that. I mean, I mean, it, it was kind of okay, but I didn't really like the, I don't know, I, I call it like putting points on a plate, you know? Yeah. I didn't really like that because um, you just fake things a lot. And I like to keep it real, you know? Mm, that's cool. So if yeah. if I were to come over to your house and you were to cook me a dinner and you were trying to impress me, you know, what would you what would you make me? 
I would go full Austrian mode and cook your roasted yeah. pork with cabbage and dumplings. Okay, that sounds so good. Yeah. <laughs> what what kind of what kind of cut of pork what, do you use? Like, is that a pork chop, or you're talking like a, a roast tender? What what would you do? Um, it basically we use the neck part of the pork, and you roast it as a whole, and you get a nice crust on it with. Man, that sounds so good. Let me let yeah. me go check uh, flights right now and. Uh... <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. So, okay, Eric, catch me up now to, to when Kendama entered your life. You were around, what, 15 when you were in this world of BMX, skate, and cooking. Uh, when did Kendama enter in, and how did that happen? I think, I think it was the second year of my apprenticeship. I was 16 years old. I was at the apprentice school. So, basically, how it works in Austria, you, you work. Uh, I was learning in a hotel. And then you have like two months of the year where you go to apprentice school. And the, and the apprentice school was so far away that I could not travel back and forth. So I stayed there and we had rooms. And there I met Kevin and he's a really good friend of mine now as well, still. Mm -hmm. And we were uh, sleeping in the same room and he had this stupid toy and he was trying to catch this red ball on this on this stupid small cup and I was like this can't be that hard give me that thing and I tried and it was hard but I eventually made it and then he just started flexing on me with the swing spike and the pull-up spike and I was like all right all right I see <laughs> that's so awesome I think I ordered one the same day do you remember which one you ordered uh yeah it was a blue sunrise oh yeah sunrise kendama they have they've been gone for a long time yeah, no, man, that's old. So how? Okay, you were you were sixteen. What year was this? Like, how how old are you now? I'm twenty five now. Oh, okay. So we're the same age. So you've been playing for almost ten years. Uh, kind of. Yeah. Getting close to that. That's yeah. crazy. That's awesome. So okay, you you got a you got a blue sunrise. Did you say? Yeah. Blue sunrise it comes in the mail. What's, what's it like for you just picking up Dama for the first time? Did you play by yourself or did you keep going over to Kev's place and, and jamming with him? Or how did that early progression start for you? Well, in the first uh, few weeks or months, it kind of worked like that. Um, I stayed at the apprentice school from Monday till Friday. And then like the weekends I was at home. And when I went home, I already had it at home. So I picked it up. I didn't really play that much. And I just took it with me at school again. And Kevin and I started playing a lot. And he showed me some tricks. And after that, we got Mario in the boat. And we got hooked. Us yeah. three got hooked. That's awesome. Uh, Mario, uh, do, do either of them still play today? Like, what's their Instagram? Um, Kevin's Instagram is k.kevoso. Okay. And Mario's Instagram is like Mario underscore Bauer or something like this. Okay. Right on. And do, do they both still play? Yes. Nice. Man, that, that's cool. So you've been playing with the same guys for almost nine years. That's really cool. Yeah. I mean, I mean um, Kevin quit his, his chef career as well. But he went yeah. into social work. Uh, but Mario is still in it. And Mario is still really hooked on the exhausting work. <laughs> yeah, on, on cooking. So is he still working at one of the uh, Michelin star restaurants or is, where, where is he working? Exactly. He's still working for, yeah. for the high class. Yeah, that's yeah. a cool experience. So I'm, I'm assuming you probably got to meet some pretty cool people uh, through that journey in your time there, hey, at the hotel. Yeah. That's cool. That, man, that was like the dream for me is working in one of those high intense kitchens. But then, you know, I look back and I'm like, I don't think I would have liked it that much. But it would have been a fun, it would have been fun to put on my resume and said, like, you know, I got to I got to cook for Gordon Ramsay or whoever that came yeah, through yeah. someone famous. That's super cool. So you, you were playing, you were 16 years old. What did the, the first year or two look like? Uh, you kept playing. When did Kendama become more serious to you? When did it become uh, this year? Um, I mean, after after like half a year or something, I started to order another one, you know. And I think I think I got I got a Chrome Kendama, 
the deluxe series back in the day. Yep. Um, I think it was a walnut one with the green tama. Mm -hmm. I really don't remember. But this kanama kind of kind of snapped on me after two weeks. It just broke off oh, under no. the Serato. So I was I was like, all right. So I kept on playing with the sunrise, and all of us three really got into Japanese kanama after that. So I was the guy playing with the beach Shin Fuji. Oh, you had a Shin Fuji. That's yeah. awesome. I never, I I've, I've never that. played with one. I was, I was loving those pieces. And Mario still does not um, want to admit that Kanam is evolving. So he's still, he's still on the, on the Osora grind. Yeah. Hey, yeah. respect to that. He probably still plays <laughs> yeah. with three finger strings too. Hey. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, so you the the story kind of keeps developing from here and at what point did you s decide that you were going to create the the origins when did that come into the picture how how long into your canonical career was that i don't know like 2016 2017 it, it was always like spinning around in my mind you know mm -hmm. i was i was on the stove cooking for 10 hours a day and in my breaks in like my half an hour breaks i had lunch and then i just went outside to play kendama but i don't know like 2017 was the year where i thought to myself if i don't do it now i will probably never do it mm. would just be be like this idea i have running around in my mind so I, I started to make a list um, of what it takes for me to to build kanamas and make kanamas. Mm -hmm. And so you would have been what? Uh, I'm thinking back, uh, you would have been like 18, 19-ish at that point? Yeah. Yeah, right around there. 18, 19, yeah. Yeah, and so you just decided that, you know, I want to I wanna create a kanama company. Why, why did you feel the need to create a kanama brand? <laughs> I, I was like, um, back in the day, nothing really changed in like the diameters of the Kanamas. And I, I ordered so many Kanamas because <laughs> I was living at home and I didn't know where to spend my money elsewhere, you know? So everything, I, I, like I had a mission back in the day to own a Kanama in every wood type there is. Mm. Why, so why did that matter to you? Why did Sorry. the wood type? Wh what? Why did you care so much about the wood type of the kanama? Why was that I so know. important? I thought it might look cool to have a walnut kanama, or I don't know, the kiyaki, the nu. Yeah. I got a Japanese maple. Uh, like I think it was an osora back in the day, like the Japanese maple, and I was really like, oh, this is some, this is some serious stuff now, you know. Mm -hmm. You, um, so, so yeah you were ordering kanamas from multiple brands and some of them would come in the same wood type did you notice a difference between you know a japanese maple kanama versus another maple kanama did could you tell the difference were you looking that that deeply at it yeah definitely also also playability wise it changed up a lot like a full beach is way different than a full ash or something like this mm -hmm. And um, what I did was to take everything apart and to mix and match together. Huh. My favorite kandama when I was working in Vienna in, at the Five Star Hotel actually was a Kayaki Osora Spike, a GT1 Birch Serato, and a GTX Terra Kandama Colat. So this, yeah. was, this was what I was rocking. And I switched the Tamas, you know? I murdered one Tama, I just put a fresh Tama on that Ken. So you you went through Tamas faster than you went through Kens? Yeah. The Kiyaki <laughs> Spike I had, it, it was it was insane. It was insane. I I think it still has a sharp spike now. That's crazy. You either never miss spikes or that Kiyaki is really, really strong. <laughs> that Kiyaki is really, really strong. Trust That's crazy. Me, I, I, I miss spikes. <laughs> no, I don't believe it. That's crazy. So you you've gone through more Thomas than 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 Kens with that. That absolutely doesn't happen anymore because now everybody's selling like Ken only options because you just grind through a Ken so fast. Do you yeah. did you glue your tip as well or was that just all natural? No, no. 
That's crazy. Is that the same across all Kayaki or was that just that Kayaki? It was just that part. I kind of think that it was like the in the inner part of the wood plank, you know, the hardwood. Yeah. Um, and I think I just got really lucky to uh, to have one of those. So you could tell immediately that that Kayaki was different than other Kayakis that you had yeah. had. That's crazy. And so did that was was it thoughts like that that inspired you to to start diving into the wood of the kendama and really diving into the origin of it and and how you there's such a difference between you know this maple versus this maple because yeah. for me like that i wouldn't even think about that that doesn't make any sense to me to think that you know one maple is different than another maple and so is that what started to kick start the journey of Do? it definitely was one part of it yeah Okay, that's crazy. Okay, so talk to me more about the origin story of Dao and, and how it came to life and where where the early steps of building the company started. So I I knew that I need um, I need a company with CNC machines that can turn them. I, so there was two ways in the beginning. The first way was I get a late, I turn it myself, mm -hmm. or I find a company that does CNC manufacturing and I let them produce in mm -hmm. in a kind of way and i try like i had a workshop um like a late workshop a woodworking workshop and i did work on the late for about two days and i tried to make a canal there and i got to the point where i had to cut off the spike and i did that and then i was like oh shit i need to turn the base cup somehow you know Oh no. So the canal was like on the lathe and it was spinning and I cut it off there where the spike was. Um, but it was still like, I did not have no base cup, you know? Yeah. And so were you not able to turn the base cup then? I w kind of was able, but I had to manage um, that the person who did the workshop was not looking because I kind of did some janky stuff on the late to yeah. get to get the to get the base cup. It's still it's still pretty shallow, but uh, Tama would land on it. <laughs> yeah. So okay. So did you have experience in a shop beforehand, or was that your first go at it? Like that, did... that was that, that was that was my first go at it, basically. So you hadn't like... worked. Did you work on a lathe ever before? No. That's crazy. So you just were like, I'm gonna create a kanama on a lathe and, yeah. and just send it. This this was like a two day workshop where you basically learn how to do stuff and we made like bowls and stuff like that. And then I asked the guy if I can just do my own thing. Yeah. And I showed him a kanama because I always had one on me. I still have. And he said, Yeah, just go ahead and do your thing and that's why I tried to make to make my first kanama. That's so cool. So d now, now you were saying that you you were trying to make the decision between making your own or getting a, a company to make them for you, a local yeah. CNC. So what did you end up deciding? I ended up deciding to let them or have them produced. Mm -hmm. So this were this 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 were a pretty pretty crucial part was taking place and it is to create kanama shape yeah so, so you you prioritize the the shape and the design and did you work closely with that manufacturer like are they local to you yeah yeah yeah, yeah. we basically learned together how to make a kanama because they do they do like um staircases you know the the handle parts and stuff like that yeah. and basically we learned together how how to make a kanama that's so cool, man. Respect to that. You're like 18, 19 years old, working with a manufacturer, building your own brand. <laughs> it's like, come on, man, that, that, that's the stuff. I love that. That's so cool. So you, you're working with them. Uh, how long did it take you to finally come out with a shape that you liked? Was that a long journey? It was a long journey. Yeah. Uh, the first, the first Kanama actually I ordered from China. It was, it was the easiest way. It was like, um, send a pdf file to china for email mm -hmm. and like two months later you receive your kanama basically mm -hmm. um but i didn't really like that way of working because i didn't know what they were using mm -hmm. you know i did not have insights at all 
Yeah. And whereas with the company that you're working with, uh, you could go over to the shop and see the wood that they're using, be there as they're making it, you know, watch the process and be there intimately. And also bring the woods to them. Yeah. They so so what, was that what you were doing? You brought the wood to them to work with? Uh, yeah. Basically, basically the first the first batch we ever did in in the Ochi shape, it was just Austrian beech wood. And we sourced Austrian beech wood from different from different companies from different I yeah. don't know wholesalers, and the prices were a little bit different. And I just picked the highest priced one, like the best quality. And you can you can definitely see or feel a difference in the beech wood. Mm -hmm. So what what difference did you notice? Like what what is the actual difference? it's harder, it's more durable than, than like a Chinese manufactured beech wood. It's way more durable than that. Interesting. The, the, the biggest problem we had in the beginning with the Tamas was that it took way too long to break in the bevel with our Austrian beech wood than it would take with the Chinese, man, Chinese right. manufactured Tama. Interesting. And was that a good thing or a bad thing? Because I think some people would say that they want it to break in fast so they can get really good at stalls. But yeah. yours would just last for forever. Yeah. Interesting. I mean, I mean, it's kind of a good thing if you watch Mr. Flux tricks that, that I think that I think that you really need to have the patience to to break in those bevels. I personally don't have the patience to do that. <laughs> <laughs> when, when I don't know either. Whenever I break in Tamas, my bevels are going oval because my playstyle is very aggressive and I don't mind like smashing Kanamas to the ground or something like that. Yeah. And I keep missing like down spikes right on the edge of the bevel and it keeps standing that way. So yeah. my bevels just turn out oval. But if you take a look at, uh, at, at Flo's Tamas, it's insane. It's really They're just insane. perfect the they, they're so they home. are they are absolutely perfect yeah you should take some of his damas and put them up on the site for like a premium price <laughs> you know pre-hone mr flox damas uh double the price you know because you've seen how these things play they're insane he's yeah. so good that's yeah it's it's absolutely crazy and so that's all beach do you only use beach or what other woods do you now work with um way uh, like in in the beginning, I only did work with Beechwood because it was m my favorite. And mm -hmm. I know I kind of had the feeling that some companies always start with Beechwood and then they they go look for some other woods, you know? And is that because Beech is cheapest? Like, is that I, the most affordable? I think so. I think so. When you order it from China, I think the Beech is just the cheapest option. Right. And, and, and I think it kind of makes sense because Beech is a softer wood. It's not as yeah. durable, so on, so on. Okay, that and but you were using Austrian beech. I didn't even know that. Like, is are there other trees native to Austria that you use in your manufacturing? Uh, right now, I really like using hornbeam. What is that? <laughs> it's a mixture between beech and birch. Way back in the day, they used it for the handles of hammers and saws and stuff like that, yeah. like tools for woodworking. And then they found out that the wood is so dense they could shred it up and turn it into pellets. Oh, and what would they use that for? For heating, because it's so dense, uh, um, it would burn really slow. Interesting, that's so cool. And so, so you've been, you, so how does that play for a Kanama? Like what, what does that change for your Kanama play style? Um, I mean, I mean, uh, Searching for this certain wood type was already pretty hard, but then getting 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 the first prototypes was insane because you have you have this you have this kendama, which is basically has all the abilities of a beech wood like um, yeah. the, the stall abilities and stuff like that, but it is way more durable than that, and it leans kind of into the birch side. So, so it has like a soft exterior, like it'll break in nicely, but it's really durable. It... Yeah, man, that I I'm gonna have to put in an order for one of those. That <laughs> so, are you manufacturing them right now? Like, are those available to buy on your site? Um, right, right now my site is looking really like my site is really starving because uh, I 
I am in the middle of the, pro uh, the last production of 2020 and the, the new production that's coming in about, I don't know, two or three weeks. Okay, so you're doing a restock here soon. Yeah. That's cool. Okay, so, okay. Talk to me about like your uh, initial launch. You, you, you went all in with this company. What was, if you don't mind me asking, and you don't have to answer this, but like what was the total cost to start your business for you and finding a manufacturer? Like how much of an investment was this that came out of your cooking money? Oof. I mean, I don't think it's really about the money. It's, it's about the time you put in. And yeah, I think totally. it was like a year before I really launched a website or something yeah. like this. I really started to collect all the things I need. Uh, but the total cost would be like, I, I don't know, rough, rough, roughly now around like 10K. Wow. So a $10,000 investment to start, to start the company. And so you had saved, did you save all that up from your, your cooking or did you take out a loan? Like what was your risk level there? I, at that time I was living at home. So I saved up all the money. So I had this, I had this deposit in my bank and I, this was, this was the decision I made. Like if I don't do it now, I, I will never do mm -hmm. it. And I just took the money and like, went with it and went ahead to make it. Yeah. Wow. That's crazy. So $10,000 to start a Kanama brand. And this was back in 2016, which for at least in North America, that was kind of a slow year for Kanama. Like Kanama was kind of in a lull at that point where it wasn't yeah. blowing up. We can't, had kind of come out of that early wave of everybody in junior high everywhere played Kanama. And then all of a sudden we went on this downtrend where it just went kind of quiet. And now we're back up on the uptrend. But did, were you afraid of that in terms of just losing your total investment, not making your money back and, and just, you know, losing it all? Was that a fear for you? No, not at all. No, you were just so committed to it. I was so committed to it. Also, I had this vision of, of me creating my own Kanama for my friends and just us having, having a product that comes from this background, you know? Man, I... I, I did not really uh, think about the negative sides in the beginning. And I think that's why it worked out in the end so well. Yeah. So the funny, the funny part about the beginning was that I was selling canals like I was selling drugs in the beginning. <laughs> You're so just basically, hustling at your basically it, it was all black market. I did not have like a registered company. I just had my products. And I have been to Kendama events and I was having this bag um, with two sides and each side fit seven Kendama. So I had 14 Kendamas on me. And then I was like, you guys need some wood? <laughs> I'll open up this thing. It was, it was kind of amazing in, in the beginning because nobody, nobody was expecting that. And That's so funny. Yeah. Okay, so you went to events. What what events did you go to? Was was there a lot of events in Austria or near there for you? I went to every single event that was happening in Europe. So okay, I now my geography is really bad, so I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna pull this up on my monitor here. But so how far away were you from most major kendama spots? Like, was Austria a big kendama scene? Mm, like Austria is located in the heart of Europe, like right mm -hmm. in the middle. And there was events in the Netherlands, in Germany, also Italy, uh, France as well. Yeah. And I just traveled to those places. Yeah. So how, how long of a drive or did you fly all, all over the place? I, like, I did take flights. You took flights. So like, yeah. so to go to France or something like that, to where all the, you know, Kandama, uh, native Kanama is, how, yeah. how much of a cost would that have been for you to fly out to there? Like for you. 100 to 150 euros. Oh, that's not too bad then. For it's I was not thinking too like, bad. and especially here in Europe, we all kind of kind of like close and kind of family. Yeah, it's kind of insane because I flew to every location there and I was welcomed. Yeah, like really warm hearted from everyone. Dude, man, I want to come to Europe so bad. The people in Europe, the, the the players in Europe seem like the most genuine fun group of guys to hang out with. There's just yeah. always events happening. You know, you, Tim, Ben Conte, Tia, like everybody. I just want to hang out with everyone. It, it looks like so much fun. Uh, and and you guys are so tight-knit, right? You, there's so many events. Uh, when when we had Tio on the show uh, a couple, 
like a month, a couple months back, mm. we were talking about how there's just always events happening for Kendama in Europe. There's like yeah. never not an event happening. And so you just had this access to go around to event, to event, to event, just pitching your company and pitching your Dama, uh, yeah. Damas to them. And so I'm curious, uh, in that early stage, what, what was the early response to your brand? Did people know about you? Did they know about the brand when you showed up? Or, and, and what was their first reaction to it? I mean, I mean, the people knew me because I was at these events for for a long time, and then then the time came where I suddenly had my own kendama. Right. And the first response to to when the people like take it in their hands and look at it, or even start to play with it, was oh, because it was great quality. The stall abilities on those OG kendamas was just insane. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's like an overall, an overall all expression, you know? Yeah. And so did you have the company name yet at that point? Were you calling it Da O? Uh, yeah. So you basically, always called Basically, it, way in the beginning, it was just O. It was just O. Just O, okay. Yeah. The a funny thing, and I have a piece here. Yeah, yeah. Was the first painted Tama production was just O. And it's that. It just had a ring around it like that. It, it's just had a ring on top and just nothing there. Just solid. And everybody all was like, why would you do that on top, you know? Because I, I was like, if you spike it, you see the ring, the O, you know? Mm -hmm. That's that cool. That was it in the beginning. That's a fun concept, but, but that makes it harder for tracking, doesn't it? It does, it does. <laughs> but... but my opinion always wa was, why do you need tracking when you have a hole, you know? You can see the hole anyways. Right. Yeah, hey, <laughs> man, if, if, that, if, if I could just see the hole, I'd be a great player. <laughs> I need as much tracking as I can possibly get. <laughs> yeah. That, that's cool. So uh, you, you started traveling around. You had your company. Were they painted Damas when you started out, the Tamas, or were they Natty? No, they were all beach natties. And also with those rings on top on a natty tama. Did you burn the all... ring in? Sorry? Were you painting the ring on early on yes. or did you burn it in? Yeah, no, it, it was painted. It was painted in like three or four colors, I think. All on the natty beach? On the natty beach, yeah. Okay, and were you doing the painting yourself? Yeah. And so you, you talked a little bit about the origins of paint and stuff like that. And some paints you don't want to be licking and all that kind of stuff. And so uh, what was that journey like? Because now you're, you're really well known, not only for your Kandama shape, not only for your style, the, the natural wood that you use, but you're also known for the paint and the quality of paint that you use on your Kandama. So it would, talk to me a little bit about the journey of the painting side of the, the brand. I mean, with me having no background at all in like woodworking or like lacquer and paint and stuff like that, it was pretty hard for me in the beginning. I was I was learning how to paint a tama in this little wooden shack we had in our garden. I completely took it over and kind of ruined it, to be honest, because <laughs> there was no like air ventilation or anything. I just went in there with with a mask on. I just started spraying Thomas out of like spray cans and stuff. Yeah. And the first, the first few tries, I actually mixed like um, clear coat out of the can and um, spraying glue. I don't know how to call it. Okay. Like a, a sticky, like a sticky paint kind of thing. It kind of turned into this sticky paint kind of thing, but it was really, it was really inconsistent because you could not control how much spraying glue you put on the Tama and then the mixture. It, I, I was kind of crazy for that because I, I had this technique and it worked out like five, four times really well. Mm -hmm. But if you start to do like 10 Tamas at a time, it kind of changed. Mm. And it was also it was also the clear I called raw rubber in the beginning because it was like a, a rubbery feel, but mm -hmm. it was like the, the touch to it was really raw. Yeah, really rough. And and so so you just like went to the to the hardware store and just bought some paint and and started doing it, or did you were, did you have like a concept you were trying to go for? Were you trying to replicate something that you had seen before? Were you trying to just 
play and find something unique and do something unique. I was well, just playing around with it, to be honest. I didn't want to replicate something because back in the day, I don't think that sticky clear was a thing. I think, yeah, I and think if it was, it, it was kind, super early. I think it kind of started when Chrome Kendama um, came out with the Slay Dog. Yeah, the lull clear on the Slay Dogs, yeah. which, which was incredibly sticky. I remember those back then. Yeah. I still got one uh, right here. Got one of the old EG mods. These things are nice. so sticky. Uh, yeah. But yeah, so you were just painting your own and you just came up with this concoction. Is that the, the same paint that you still use today? No, 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 no. I mean, um, I, I, I had like four, four drops with like hand painted stuff, which, which is not even on my Instagram feed. That's the funny thing because mm -hmm. before, before I posted the six pictures you can find at the bottom of the feed on the, the origins account, mm -hmm. I had no feed post at all. Everything was happening in the story. Right. So you were just you were just selling stuff through your stories and people had to be there to know it. I I didn't even sell stuff on the Instagram. So no. you you had to meet me in person to get a hold of one of my kendamas basically back in the day. Yeah. So you were only selling locally back then. You weren't doing any online orders, you weren't shipping no. any product. It was all just no. hand to hand. Yeah. So when did the company start to to grow beyond just doing, you know, sales? When did you realize that this was more than just, you know, a side hustle, more than just, you know, you're passing out kendamas, traveling to events, hustling 14 out of your bag every event you go to? When did it start <laughs> becoming a bit more of a serious operation where you're like, okay, no, this is actually like kind of my job now. I, yeah. I build kendamas, I launch kendamas, and I have thousands of customers or hundreds of customers. I mean, I registered the company in June 2017, I guess. Okay, so about a year after you started. Yeah, and that's, and that's where things got a little bit serious. I started to work on an online shop and, and started, started to, to look into like marketing and stuff like that. Yeah. So I quickly, what realized, I quickly realized that I didn't really want to to be the to be that generic kendama brand that is just mm -hmm. putting up these ads you know um so i still did not have any any feed posts so if you wanted to be updated on what i do you had to follow the story right you had to be there and be active following yeah. the oh if you wanted yeah. in it wasn't a passive thing it was like be there or you're not there that's yeah. kind of cool. It, it creates it's like live feeling like you're actually there yeah. in a unique way. That's cool. I like that. And I, and, and I think where it got the, 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 the most serious, I came up with this idea to split, to split uh, three images, like these six images or the six posts I, I was talking about on the bottom of the feed was like this concept I was, I was working on to introduce the Kanama to everyone. And basically, that's what I was working on. And these were these infamous six posts that were up for like, I don't know, one month or two months. Mm -hmm. And after that, I launched a website with Beach Natics. And that was it? I, I, I just uh, started, like, where I started on the events, I started again online. So everything was like ground zero back then so it was beach natties and i had one other option like really ochis um will remember those because it was the only two options on my web show it was beach mm -hmm. natties and the beach natty with a painted middle stripe and beeswax tama with a, a a beeswax tama yeah what do you mean by that like what does that mean um i had this massive jar of beeswax without paraffins so it's like liquid beeswax. Okay. And basically, I, 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 how do you say that? I put that beeswax on the tamas and you have to let them sit for about a week until they really dry through. And after that, you have that beautiful beeswax smell, but also a little bit, just a slightly little bit of tackiness on the tama. Interesting. So that was like your original kind of paint on it on a natty. It was just adding a little bit of tack to the natty itself. And so what how did that change the play of the, the Tama? Did that change the durability or anything like that with the wood? It changed it 
it changed the color. So the beech wood went into, into this like, I don't know, light, dark, brownish color. Mm -hmm. And the smell was amazing. That's cool. And, and that's kind of like what people do now with uh, conditioner, right? Because conditioner is pretty much just yeah. beeswax uh, and uh, like coconut oil. And maybe they'll add yeah. like a, essential oils or whatever to make it smell nice. And, and then you put that on your Thomas. So you got like wh whatever uh, brand of it. I have a uh, right here. Like this, this one's one of my faves. I got this from New Lace Canonla. It's a coffee shop uh, conditioner. So oh, I, nice. I don't play with a ton of natties, but when I do, I put this on and it just smells like coffee. It is so good, yeah. but that, that's super cool. Um, okay. So I want to know, because I feel like every business owner uh, remembers their first day of launching their website and how that went. Do you, do you remember the first day of launching your website or the first day that you like did a sale on your website? Yeah, I was kind of expecting like people, people like um, crushing my door to get these beach natties, you know? Yeah, but I only sold like five or seven in the first <laughs> two weeks. Oh, how did that feel? <laughs> it, I, I don't know. It, it was kind of a, it was kind of a, um, like, it kind of got me down a little bit. Yeah. But I didn't let this small thing get in the way of my plan of building this empire. <laughs> yeah okay so so you you didn't have a, a crazy successful first two weeks but still to sell like five or seven kanamas like people people don't actually think how much that money that actually is five, mm. like how much how much is one one kanama one uh how much were you selling them for at the time i uh the beach netty i think was 27 euros and the honeymoon like i called it the beeswax tower was like 30 yeah, so you, you still made like a couple hundred bucks and, you know, of revenue, you know, minus yeah. your cost and all that, which is still like any time. Okay, so like whether or not you're selling lemonade or you're selling stuff from a garage sale or you're building your own company and you're selling stuff, it's like it feels good to, to like make a profit off of something that you're doing. It, it felt really, really good to, yeah. to even sell one product because the people take time to search up your website. Yeah. And to go on this website and spend their real money on it it felt really good yeah and then you're like you get this deposit in your bank account and you're like whoa this is real i finally yeah, yeah, like yeah. actually made money doing this thing that i've just dumped ten thousand dollars into i spent all this time building this thing and someone bought it and it kind of like whether or not it like pays itself off right away it's a, that's an exhilarating feeling like if anyone else has started a business they know what that feels like and it feels yeah. so good so you didn't have the most successful first two weeks. So when did it start becoming more successful? When did you, how, how did that start to take, take off for you? Because now the O is a fairly successful company from at least an outside perspective. Like it seems like it's going really well for you. When did it start picking up? Do you remember? I think, I think where I really realized um, that people don't really like to play with beach natties, but they didn't like from from this picture on the internet you cannot really tell the difference on this beach netty versus uh just a random beach netty you know because oh. this was this was kind of something special if you did swing to bird you instantly knew what this thing was about so um it took off when i released the first hand painted kanamas the first mm. few tama designs actually yeah. Uh, and so what were your first two Tama designs? How did you design them? Uh, what was the process there? Just out of my mind. Um, I didn't really think that much. I, I, had, I had one design, um, which, which I am still salty till this day that I didn't do more than seven. So basically those releases were really, really limited. I so did you like only did 14, seven of each? 14 Tamas. I basically had two styles. And I did seven Thomas. And they were all hand painted? Like, were they all painted the same or were they all kind of unique? They were all kind of unique. You know, I, during, during these days, I kind of tried to replicate them, to have them look the same. And this is why I only did like five to seven pieces to have them all look the same. Yeah. Wow, that's so cool. And so did those sell out like instantly for you on that launch when you finally launched those ones? Yeah. I mean, like not instantly, but like in one or two hours, they were yeah. done. Yeah. 
And so at that point, did you, you started probably realizing like, okay, now, now I'm on to something. This is yeah. what people actually want. Also, I'm curious, like after people finally got your, your Natty Beach Thomas and your Natty Beach Ken's, did, did people start coming back once they started talking about it and realizing that this isn't the same as those other Natty Beach Kanamas? Uh, yeah. Did you start getting more customers for that as well because people were talking about it as different? Of course. Um, I think it's until this day that some people are discovering what my Kanam is about and what makes it so different than all the other products on the market. When I was having this uh, free shipping weekend, mm -hmm. one or two weeks after, the people from those from those areas of like, I guess they're friends of them. They just ordered like only, only one Hornbeam can. And it's so crazy that I sent one can to Canada or to America here from Austria. That's so cool, man. I, I've played, I, I don't own a, a Do personally, but I've played one and it's, it's a totally different kind of feel. Like it's, yeah. it's, it's durable. You can tell that it's a high quality wood. You can tell that someone's actually selected this and put it into production. It's not just like they dumped a truck of wood and they're like, all right, throw it all into the lathe and let's just go. It's like, no, you're there. There's an intentionality behind the choice that was made to use that. Yeah. And, and the quality is honestly so, so good. And the paint is incredible. Like playing with the paint was so fun. It was a totally different experience of paint than I, I had experienced on most Kendamas. Cause I mean, most of them, you, you experience most paints and they're all made in the same factory. The sticky is pretty, you know, pretty comparable across all the brands and the, yeah. the uh, silk paint is pretty much all the same, but, but it was different. It had kind of that rubbery silk kind of sticky. It took a little bit of all of those worlds and put it together into one uh, Tama and it felt so good to play. True. True. The idea behind it was to, to create something that's really soft for your hands but does work on the camp. So you have the tackiness, but it's also like really smooth and, and just a nice hand feel to it. Yeah, that's cool. So you, you had this successful day launching these Kendamas, these hand painted ones. After that, were you like, okay, I'm just gonna get to painting and just paint, 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 paint. Or yeah. did you have a different idea or a different plan? I mean, I mean, I kind of worked on designs all the time and I, I just, I just tried out multiple things to, to have, to have something that's like original. But I think, I think what's really nice is um, if I look at designs I did way back in time and I look at stuff I'm able to do now, it's pretty insane and pretty crazy how yeah. how this thing developed absolutely so have you have you changed anything in terms of the production style the painting recently or have you have you got it down to a t you're still working with the same company that produces yeah and so you, you've been with them for like nine years or not nine years five six years you started in 2016 almost six I years started, i i actually started to sell online in 2018 but I registered the company in uh, like June 2017. 2017. So you've been you've been rocking on the site for almost four years, yeah. uh, and and mostly in Europe. But recently, I feel like Do is also taking off a lot of you know you know taking flight in North America. More and mm. more American orders, more and more Canadian orders. Have you seen that trend grow? Is that a new emerging market for you? And and how are you working with that? Like last year. Um, a third of my total sales, I would say, are going to North America. And um, I kind of wanted to improve the service for these guys. And I, in the beginning, I shipped with the Austrian Post. Like, mm -hmm. I think in America, it's USPS. Yep. And it was kind of a lottery, in my opinion, because some packages were delivered in like two or three weeks. And then some were about to get lost and just take, I don't know, two months to be delivered. Right. So I searched into, uh, I actually, I actually searched for a solution for those people to order this Kendama, to have a decent shipping. And I'm just rocking like the TNT Express now. And I'm pretty lucky I got some friends, uh, like a shipping company and 
they are giving me like good prices. I still pay a little amount on top of what the US and Canadian customers are paying mm -hmm. for the shipping, but I think that's worth it. So, so for, for those of us that are tuning in and kind of thinking about ordering a dough, uh, how much would it cost to ship for, for me to get one in Canada? Like how much would I be paying? I think for Canada, it's around, it's around 21 euros. The thing okay. is, um, I get the best prices for the US orders. So mm. the shipping for the US customers is like 19 euros, but I pay way more than that. <laughs> it's a little gift from me to them, you know? Yeah, man, shipping's crazy. I've been running uh, uh, distribution for Seoul up here in Canada for a while, yeah. and it's so expensive. Canadian shipping is terrible. It's like $20 to ship pretty much anywhere unless you're shipping locally in the province it's awful that's it crazy uh, and so you're you're looking at doing more international stuff have you considered uh what what it would look like to work with the distributor in the states and so ship them one big box and then they do your distribution because i think that's what companies like chrome have started doing you know as they've grown and scaled i don't think they're shipping yeah. all of their products out of denmark anymore i think to america they have like an american warehouse that gets them shipped out of the thing with my products and Kanamas is like they are still really limited. I don't really produce like right. hundreds or two hundreds of one design. If I do a hand painted style, it's mostly around twenty five to thirty tamas. That's what I that's what I really like on working, and that's where what my working space is kind of limited to. Mm. And but I am working with MJ from Kanama Depot. Yeah, oh, MJ's great. And actually, there is a big box resting in the US that's just waiting to be released to the customers. Oh, that's awesome. Well, so, yeah. so we got to be watching out for Kanama Depot. We just had MJ on here a couple of weeks ago. We were talking about Kanama Depot. That's awesome. I think, I think he will drop them on the site if, if, uh, when his website is ready or the webshop yeah. is launching. I think yeah, that's he when yeah, he was saying he's looking at getting the website up in the next month or, or two or somewhere, yeah. somewhere around there. So he's in process. Oh, man, that guy is great. MJ is one of the greatest gems in the uh, Kandal community. Absolutely. So, okay, what, what do you see as the future of Doe? And, and then I want to talk a little bit about your team and, you know, some of the culture and what you're trying to, to, to try and do in the world here. But where do you see Doe in the next couple of years? Do you want to stay hand painting everything? Because yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, that is that is something that's really important to me because it's my art output, I would say. Mm. And I also want to continue to to grow in that process. Yeah, and the future and the future of the O, I think I think is to get it into more hands. Yeah. So what, what do you see as the biggest opportunity for you, uh, for the company, you know, going forward? Where do you see the biggest room for growth for Doe? Mm, that's a hard question. Yeah, I'll, I'll, let, I'll let you, you stew on that for a second. And yeah. because <laughs> I think it'll be a good answer. I'm, I'm really curious to, to hear your perspective on it. Could you repeat that question? Yeah, what, what, do you, what do you see as the biggest opportunity for growth for Doe? Like, what, what's an opportunity out there that you want to seize? I think, I think we're, especially with the can shape we're working with, it's just, it's, it's just the difference to get people back on the ground. When mm. we started playing Kanama, Kanama was something that was really challenging. And with the... With the new shapes and everything, like in the past few years, everything has been evolving to get bigger. And bigger is not always better, in my opinion. Do you, so, so I, oh, go I, ahead. I think, like, compared to other shapes that are around now, I think we are rocking the smallest cups in the game. Hmm. But it is still possible to hit everything. Uh, oh, like the new gen tricks, it is still possible to hit it with them. Yeah. So you don't plan on making a, an upscale Dama or something that is, you know, quote unquote, easier to land newer gen tr tricks on it. I am kind of planning on it, but the cost to make these uh, with, with the company I'm working with, 
it's really crazy high. And this is why I was thinking to host the Kickstarter project because a lot, mm. a lot of people are asking me to do a bigger Kanama shape. Mm. And why does it, why does it cost so much to up the size of it for you? Like what, what is the reason that it costs so much? The, the thing is we buy, we buy wood planks and wooden boards to make these Kanamas. Mm -hmm. So you buy full boards, you cut them into pieces, you turn them into cylinders, and then you start to make these parts, you know, the Serrano and the can. Mm -hmm. And the, the thing with bigger, with bigger cups is that you need bigger wood boards and bigger right. wood boards are just more expensive. And with bigger cups, you need different tools to hold these, these wooden pieces to turn them. So right. it, it is basically a fresh new start. You have to get new tools. You have to get bigger wood planks, and it is just, it is just. Um, yeah, and sorry, I was going to ask: Do you would you have to foot the bill for that because you're working with a, pro a producer, like someone that's manufacturing it? Do you actually have to pay for all the tools, or would you just be paying for the wood? I actually have to pay for all the tools as well. Wow, yeah, that's crazy. That, and, and I think people don't always uh, recognize like the difference of cost and those sorts of things. And as a business owner, you begin to realize like the intricate little details of cost that go into things. And it's like, it's, it's a lot, you know, from your Indeed. software that you use, you got to pay your taxes, you got to, man, running a business is not that simple. No, it's not that simple. And also, also like these wooden parts are not the only thing you need for a Kanawa product. Yeah, absolutely. So, okay. Uh, uh, before I want to jump into some questions here from uh, the live chat and from from the post here in a couple seconds, uh, but I want to ask one more question before we do, and then and then afterwards let's talk about your team, kind of the future culture, talk about a European Kanama scene a little bit, and what you want to see in Kanama in the future. But uh, I want to know, um, okay, so the origins is all about going back to the origins. Where have you seen that play out in in all aspects of of the company where are some other opportunities in your company to to really focus on the origin of the brand because you're working really hard with the wood and the tom and the paint and you do pretty much everything by hand but do you ever want to go into turning them yourself in the future is that something you still desire to do mm, i don't know maybe like one-off things or like custom things but if if I would want to make these uh, in the quality I'm used to sell now, I, I would need to put in some serious years of work, like Alex Smith does, for yeah. example. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Alex, Alex is great. I, I have a lot of respect for anyone who turns a Kandala by hand. That, that is not easy. <laughs> anyone who's even actually, attempted it knows. Actually, a fun fact is that um, when I started to search for the company and we found a way uh, to work together on this project. Um, I imagined to turn these two or three parts uh, with Tom included, that it must not be that much of work, you know? Mm -hmm. it, it actually takes 27 steps to make these, these yeah. three parts. Yeah, how long does it take to make one Kendama? Like if from start to finish, if you were to make one? You know, first you have to cut the wood. You have to turn it into yeah. cylinders and then you turn it into the rough shape and then there is a refining thing, a refining run. Then you need to sand it. Then you need to mount it back to turn the base cup, for example. Then you need to cut off the top. Then you need to make the spike. After that, you're going to take this piece and drill the string hole and the chamfer for the string not to go in. That's where the spike is done. The Serato mm -hmm. is a little bit more difficult because we are we we were experimenting with with like drills for for the cups, but it did not really work out for me because because it was so inconsistent. So turning the Serato is kind of a secret I keep for myself because it was a lot of work, but it's but it's a double that steps that it takes to turn the can. It's double the steps to, to turn the yeah. Serato. Interesting. Because you have to hold it on each side. You know, you have a big right. cup and a small cup and you need clamps for the bigger cup. You need the clamps for the small cup. Huh. 
That's cool. So do you work uh, in the shop much? Like, do you go there very often? Or, or is it very batch oriented? Like, do you just do one batch at a time and then release them? Or is there always a steady production taking place? There is, there is a big production. And we finish, we, we finish uh, parts of the parts, basically. Okay. So, so in total to make like, I obviously you, you would never make just one kendama at a time. You kind no, of do it no, in no. batches, it's but that's just, just but, senseless. <laughs> yeah. That, that would be ridiculous. You know, we make them one at a time that that's ridiculous yeah. to think about, but uh, how long roughly would you say if you were to break down the math, how long does it take to make one kendama? Like one hour, one and a half hours. That's crazy. And so pe people maybe, don't maybe more actually, because you need to, you know, need to change the tools all the time and mount the CNC machines in a different way. It man, would maybe take about two hours. Man, when you do all the math and everything and put it all together, your cost of your materials, the amount of time you put in, and then how much you sell it for, it's like, man, you got to make so many of them to actually start being profitable. And, and that's the passion. That's the grind. That's the love of the game that you put into it. And, yeah. and respect to you. That, that's a grind. You've put in the money, you've put in the time, and now it's, you know, you're seeing it pay off on itself and, and you're building this business and you're building this empire. And it's so cool yeah. to see. Uh, that would take place. Okay, uh, let's take a little break. Let's ask some questions from the chat. We always like to, to give the, the community some voice in these conversations. So we've got a couple of questions here. Uh, one from Colin Hislop, h.slop on Instagram. We just had him on the show last week. Eric, the wood quality from Da'o is top tier. Can we tap into your sourcing process a bit to understand what makes your material so high quality? Uh, we talked a little bit about this, but do you want to touch on it a little bit more and dive a little bit deeper into it? I mean, I think the main difference than uh, foreign production is that I get to see the wood in its raw form, and basically we pick we pick stuff. When we when we were first making making those hornbeam kandamas, I actually went to this old uh, guy that owns the forest, and we checked the wood, and we got we got a little bit of the wood, and we turned. We turned some prototypes and then and then it was clear for me that i have to buy this whole batch that he had of this buy the whole wood. forest <laughs> not the whole forest but in his like warehouse there were several planks that did that were just like this dried hornbeam wood just waiting for me to turn it into <laughs> That's cool. Uh, is there, uh, this is my question, not one of one from the chat. Is there a type of wood that you really want to work with that you haven't worked with yet? Mm, like olive wood. I really like the grain Ooh. of olive wood. Olive wood is so cool. Yeah. But right now we are working with ash and oak. Okay. Have you ever considered work, working with a uh, maple burl, like a burl maple wood? I have, I have, but it's really hard to find. Yeah, to it's find expensive. Wood boards that are thick enough, you know. Yeah, but it's so beautiful. Like if you can find it, it's the coolest it wood in the world. It's so it cool. Is. Oh, that's awesome! If you do ever make one, even if you make one one-off, hit me up. I'll, I'll, I'll be your customer for it. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. <laughs> all right. Uh, Tio, Tio wants to know why are Do cheat codes for stalls? <laughs> um, it's all in the mathematics. All in the math. Do you do you get really deep into that, into the math and the measurements and the scale? Was that a long process to find out what was the perfect shape for stalls? Actually, it was first try because we did a lot of calculations: how big, how big the bevel should be, and how the big cup and the small cup and the handle should look like to have it fit perfectly. Mm -hmm. It was That's actually cool. first try, and we produced the prototype at the factory we are producing now. And the first prototypes were were mind blowing, and and that's what you've been using pretty much ever since. Is that shape? Yeah. You haven't changed the shape since you started, right? I did several times. Okay. Each year. Each year. A, just a like an update on it, or and what have you changed throughout that process? Basically, you have this whole batch, and you play with it for half a year, and I am the the, the biggest critic. There is oh, on my own kanama. I believe it. Um, so the first shape was was like um, like stall orientated and like all around orientated, mm -hmm. and it was also uh, taller than, than than all the kanamas on the market back then. 
Mm. So you have fast flips and nice slings, but the the only downside was the lunar because they were saying uh, standing on there so steep. Right. So the second shape, I uh, I did increase the diameter of the cups, but also also this handle part until this part was very important to me. The second mm -hmm. shape had a spike which which went uh, thinner for like half a millimeter mm -hmm. until the top. And what we found out there is in combination with the bevel, if if you like start to go for a trick and you start like that, it kind of fell out all the time because yeah. it was getting thinner. Right, it was too short and too thin. Yeah. Yeah, and so just like minor adjustments here and there. Is there something that you want to adjust on your Kanama now for this year? Is there something that you've made a recent adjustment on or you like where it's at? The last the, the last changes were really the last one because like right now everything is perfect and I really yeah. don't want to change everything on it. Yeah, if you change it, we don't know if Mr. Flox will be able to do those stalls anymore. So <laughs> He will be able to do it. Oh, I know. <laughs> you can give him any kendama and he'll, he'll do it. Okay, uh, Flurry Mac plays Dama wants to know, when it comes to your rubber clear, uh, uh, rubber clear uh, are coats applied differently depending on the drop? So either a thicker or a thinner coat. So is there a variance in drops because you do them in such, you know, it's, it's hand painted every time. So yeah. is there a significant difference from drop to drop on the quality of the paint? Or do you have one that you, you use as like the standard? Basically, basically the clear is always the same. The thing is that it depends on the circumstances a lot. The humidity in the spraying room, the temperature yeah. actually in the spraying room. Um, it's things you don't usually uh, take care of that matter so much and that are like mind blowing that it makes such a difference. The rubber coat is still applied by humans and humans do make, we make mistakes. Yeah. And if you have this Tama on the holder and you're just turning it and spraying it with the spray gun, it can happen that one time it's a little bit thinner and mm -hmm. the other Tama it's a little bit thicker. Interesting. So, and, and that adds the variance to it. So do you, what, you know, is there a big difference between one that's thinner and thicker? Do you notice the play style difference? Does it create a really diverse set of Thomas for you? And then everybody kind of has a different experience or is it pretty relatively the same? It's relatively the same. The, the thing is I work with this, with this clear code for about two years now and I see every difference every yeah every like um, 0 0.1 millimeter yeah. difference of the thickness of the layer. Yeah, you're, you're, you're right there in it. You're seeing it. It's not <laughs> yeah. coming from a manufacturer elsewhere. You're the guy looking at it going, oh, that one's thick. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, one more question from the post and then I'll, I'll see if there's some from the chat. And then I wanna know about your team. I wanna know about the people on your team and if you're looking to add more people, everybody, anytime we have a company owner on the show, I literally always get tons of questions from people like, oh, wh what do I need to do to get sponsored by your company, blah, blah, blah. All those fun <laughs> questions that every company owner dreads getting in their, in their DMs. Uh, we'll talk through that a little bit. But Mark's Flower wants to know, is breaking in of the Tama meant to happen or is it a side effect? I mean, breaking in the paint uh, so it becomes stickier due to playing is it, you know, like he, I think what, what they're asking is, is that an intentional process? You know, why, why wouldn't companies just send you a broken Intama? I, I don't know. I think it's a nice part to have, to have this fresh product and you got to destroy it yourself. I mean, breaking in a Tama is kind of a natural process because we're smashing two wood pieces together, you know? And the... The thing is that you kind of want to look into the durability of a clear coat and some are like cracking or breaking off the Tama and some are just like denting in. With, with this batch production I have with this rubber clear, it's when you apply a primer basically and you sand it off and you apply a little bit too much pressure, you're underneath the coat as well. And on this part of the Tama, when you, when, you spray, when you spray the rubber on top, it might, it might break off or 
or um, like um, chip off the tama. Mm. But I think like breaking in the tama is like the most beautiful process you can ever do because it oh, gets yeah. better all the time. That, I think it's part of the story, right? You're, yeah. As you're getting better, the tama is also getting better with you. Yeah. And slowly you're just growing with the ken and that ken and you almost have this own relationship together because it's mimicking your play style. Like you said, your Thomas turn into ovals because you miss the, you know, what, you know, you, you keep hitting in the same spot. <laughs> you know, you look at a guy like Mr. Flox, he's probably got a, a bevel that's so perfectly honed for the stalls that he does. Other guys have, you know, Thomas that are designed for lunar, whatever. And it's like, it breaks in, in a pattern that's similar to the person's play style. You can tell where they land their lunars. I, uh, where, uh, I don't know if I have it next to me somewhere. I have, uh, I don't even remember, but my Liam mod, I always get like on one half of my Thomas, it turns into like natty and the other half mm -hmm. is sticky. And I leave it that way because I like to use one half of the Tama for like doing, you know, whatever it is, adjustments, uh, doing yeah. like rovers and the other half, I want it to be really sticky so that when it lands. And so my really broken in Thomas are like half natty, half sticky. And that's just the way they are. And, and that's just how my Thomas break in over time. And everybody breaks theirs in differently because it matches your play style. And I think that's a beauty. I think that's what it's all about. Okay, let me hit one or two more questions here. And then I want to know about Mr. Flox and if there's other people on your team, because I actually don't know if there are. I don't, I don't know your team well enough. So I think, I think I have to leave you for a bit because I need to turn off the low battery mode here on this iPhone. Because oh, my, can... my, my screen is always getting black. So I'm trying to fix that. I'll be <laughs> all right, well, we'll give him a quick second here and we'll get... Eric back in here. Guys, as we do, I want to say a huge thank you for you guys tuning in to this episode live. Again, if you are appreciating the show, if you love what's going on here and you've been a follower of the show and you want to support the show and get a little bit more engaged, we do have a Patreon that you can subscribe to for $5 a month. And that gives you behind the scenes access to the content that goes into the show. You'll be the first to know of the new guests that are coming up and other content uh, that you wouldn't normally see from my front facing Instagram stuff. It's a wonderful shot of Mr. Eric there. There we go. <laughs> I'm always ready for a little commercial break. <laughs> okay, so um, we, we had a question here coming in from uh, Flurry Mac. Uh, and, and this is kind of a question going back to the shipping prices, I think, a little bit. And, and the plan there. We have Flurry Mac plays Dama. Will we ever see more Da'o out here in Canada? Now... The, the irony is, is you sending it to Kanama Depot doesn't actually change the price much for us because it's still like $20 to order from the States to Canada. So yeah. would you ever look at partnering with a Canadian distributor? There is a Canadian distributor when we're talking right now. So Oh, fancy. You guys fan are very lucky out there. Well, that is awesome. I have a feeling I probably know who it is. And if, and if it's who I think it is, it's a great choice. Great person. Just... Do, do, do you want to, is it, is it Michael from Kenoma, Michael, Michael from Kenoma Club Canada, or is it Spiffy Toys? It's the second one. Nice. Selvia is fantastic. She's amazing. Yeah. We really love her in Canada. She, and, and we are very lucky now to hear that Dao is going to be more accessible here in Canada. When, when's that happening? Um, it should happen. It should be happening in summer. Okay. There you go, yeah. Flurry Mac. We're going to get some Da'o oh, here in Canada. It's going to be even more accessible. <laughs> uh, okay, he also wants to know, when is the next drop for Da'o? Oh? Um, the, the next drop, like, uh, uh, in January, I think, in the first two weeks of 2021, I did a little poll and a little question thing on my Instagram, asking the people, what do you want to see? I already had... I already had like plans for myself of what I want to do, mm -hmm. but I took those answers from the people and I actually made it reality. A lot of people were requesting 62 millimeter Thomas with my hand painted style. And that's what, uh, that's what I was working on in the last few weeks and months. And these are about to drop. I also have the shirts made and also, also some, some Kanama session accessories that you might need for your MD okay. set. Well, what kind of accessories? Do you, want to, do you want to leak it here or do you want to keep that a secret for now? I'm working on string jars. That's all I'm going to say. String jars? Yeah. Okay. 
one thing that really bugs my mind is that people really pay so much money for like five strings. I really don't get it. Yeah, it, it's not so, expensive, but we like to pay for the branding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what I'm trying to do is get you a, a little chart with strings per days, basically. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. I know a lot of people, you know, maybe some brands wouldn't, wouldn't like me saying this, but a lot of people will just buy strings from, say, Amazon or from Michaels or wherever they shop. You know, Lovely Knots is a pretty popular brand that people order from online. I think people order from Amazon and all that kind of stuff. It was actually what I was using in the first year. You were using Lovely Knots? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a super popular brand that a lot of people order from. And they just order like the big spool of it. And then they can just yeah, cut yeah, it down uh, to whatever size they want. Yeah. And instead of like waiting for the company to create larger strings, because, you know, the Sweets had their six finger strings and then they up them to eight finger or whatever it is now. And, and every brand kind of has it. But if you just buy your own spool, you can restring it to whatever length you want. That's but true. absolutely. OK, so uh, one more question here. And then I want to know about your team. We got a question here from uh, Holes Fail Laroe. I don't know if I said that at all right. I apologize. Uh, do you <laughs> use, he wants to know, or they want to know, do you use one kendama at a time or do you have multiples and switch them to try different tricks or combos? Me personally? Yeah, you. Uh, I am, I'm the most spoiled kendama player in the world, I guess. I just I just take one kendama and I play with it for a little bit and if if I wake up in the morning and I feel like something else I just string up the fresh one. Sure, yeah, absolutely, <laughs> yeah. dude. Uh, you have no idea. I get that. Uh, like, so I have boxes and boxes of kendamas from Seoul. I, I love yeah. the Seoul shape. I I love all kendamas. I'm I'm not really that picky, but uh, whenever I'm like ah, I just want to play with a fresh one, I'm just gonna go open one up. Take it out of my wholesale numbers. I'll pay for it, and and I'll yeah. just play with a fresh one today, and it feels so good. And so I, but, I get that. But I but I really try to play with one kanama until it's broken. But I almost never succeed in that. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, I I don't as much anymore. I used to break in my tamas like crazy. I I should always keep one uh, nearby. But my old like I one of my first kanamas I ever bought was a TJ Kolsnick Pro Mod. Uh, yeah. Like the, the old Kaizen 1.0, like not even the 2.0, like the old one, it will make waves one. And I have literally half of the Tama chopped off because I, I did so many tricks on it. Like a chunk of the Tama came off and I was like, I'm proud of that. I'm proud <laughs> yeah. that I played a Kendama that much that the Tama was broken on both sides. And my EG mod as well, my old EG mod uh, is like that as well. Okay, uh, one last question. And then I wanna know more about the, the team because I saw it come through the chat. This is like an every week question. This gets asked by someone. Uh, Haley Bischoff wants to know, I always ask, uh, what's your hair care regimen? <laughs> um, I don't know, I wash it with shampoo every like four days and then I just rock with it. There you go, Bish. If you wanna know, that's all you gotta do. Wash your hair every four days, you got hair like Eric. I mean, I mean, I mean, I use shampoo every like four or five days, but I wash them with water every day. Right, right. And, yeah. and basically that's, that's this, this period I always go through, you know, uh, like today is the first day they're really fresh and tomorrow they're going to look fantastic. Day after tomorrow, they are kind of look good and then it starts to get messy and then I wash it again with shampoo. <laughs> right, yeah, I feel that. I've been, I've been rolling the like, I think every three days I've been doing the shampoo. I shampooed this morning, so my hair's like very light and tomorrow it'll be nice. And, and yeah. so that, it's, it's just how it works, guys. If you didn't know, <laughs> the review is not just about coffee, but it's also about up in your style and, and <laughs> taking care of your hair. Awesome, okay, so tell me about your team. Um, We've talked a lot about Mr. Flox. Who is Mr. Flox? Who else is on your team, if there is anyone? And what's the future of the, the Dao team look like? So the team is called Family. Because every single player is really close to me, and I know them really well. Um, Mr. Flox is this hometown kid that was also playing Kenam and keeps beating me in the game of Ken whenever we played one at the skate park. And... So there is Mr. Flox, there is Michael, uh, there is Jonas, and there is uh, Jonel Onino Dama. Oh yes, Onino, absolutely. And and yeah. Michael, did you say? Yeah. Uh, what what's his uh, Instagram? 
Michael.ps, I think. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I yeah. know that one as well. Absolutely. And he's so from, He's from the UK, and he was one of the first, um, like, international economic friends I had. And we are really close, and I discussed every single point of, of the plan of me building this Kanama brand. And this guy was having my back all the time. So it was kind of a no-brainer for me to, to have him, him on the family. Yeah, okay. So uh, I, t take some time. Brag about your players. Tell me about each of them. Why did you put them on your team? W what do they bring to the Do family? What, why, do you, why did you choose them? So Michael, Michael basically is the voice. I call him the voice because he, he whenever he, he opens his mouth, it's good energy and it's fun, especially at Kendama events. And he, he's one of the closest international Kendama friends I, I have made. So that's Michael. Uh, Floxy is the hometown kid, um, which, which exploded when, when he gets sponsored. The, I think you saw tricks and I don't really think that we need to talk about how, how screwed up and fucked up this, <laughs> yeah, he's this, insane. this stuff is, he does. And actually, actually, I think we were at the skate park where I just asked him if, if he wants to be a part of it, if, if he wants to receive free downs, basically. <laughs> so he said, yeah. And after like one or two months, like one and a half months after, after I gave him his first box, he said, oh, God damn, I tried to play with a different Kanam and it doesn't work for me anymore. I, I am so hooked on it. Mm -hmm. And I'm really glad I got him hooked on that. Yeah, hey, absolutely. Yeah. Dude, you, he's, he's a good player to have on your team. He definitely, he definitely puts the brand on his sleeve and wears it proudly. And, and then Onino, you, you were saying? Yeah, uh, Chanel is the Italian guy. Um, I think it was like 3 a.m. 3 in the morning. I was doing some design work and I, I went to bed. And before I went to bed, I scrolled Instagram and I saw this guy doing doing uh, tricks with style and with ease and i was like damn this is exactly what i'm looking for um to have on my on on my team and in the family to represent our products mm -hmm. and i hit him up i just told him that he should he should give me his address i will send him something he i think he didn't even know that i'm the owner of origins <laughs> And I just sent him a beach netty, one beach netty, and he went crazy on it. It kind of reminded me um, what mi what Mr. Flox did in in the beginning, yeah. Because he had such a great style. He was doing tricks that nobody did, and I was like, yeah. hmm, a very unique could, play style. Yeah, maybe I could sponsor this guy as well. So I hit him up. We talked, and he eventually said, yeah, he wants to join the family. Dude. The first task, the first task I gave him is to name a Kendama design I did, a hand painted Tama. I sent it to him and told him, "You can choose the name of this release of this Tama." Yeah. Basically, what he came up with was the the mint milk. Oh yeah, that one. I, that's the one I played. That one's dope. I love that yeah. one. That design is so good. Um, let's talk about Jonas. Jonas is, is also from Austria and, but he's living in the, in the most, uh, Western part of Austria. Okay. And I'm like in the North and it was, um, like we had, um, Innsbruck Kendama open. Innsbruck is also located in the Western part of Austria and we had a Kendama open there and I was playing with this with this idea to add it, um, to add him to the family because number one I really like this guy number two it's always fun with him and we got drunk and we had so much fun a yeah. lot of times and he's also good at Kendama and he's really good with people he brings good energy to everyone basically so 
at the day of the event, I I had this drawstring bag with two kendamas, with like unreleased special kendamas. And I was like, you know, I've playing with the idea of adding someone, but I kind of need a need your need your um, opinion on that. And it was like, yeah, who are we talking about? And he thought that we were talking about someone else because mm -hmm. I put it that way. It yeah, like, yeah, you're teasing him. You know, him. this guy called Jonas, and I think he's a really great guy. He looks good. He plays Kendama in a very <laughs> unique way as well. And, and he was like, what? For real? And it was, it was an instant match. That's awesome. So you got four guys on your team then. So Maiko, Jonas, Onino, and Mr. Flox. Yes. That's awesome. And are you looking to add more people to your team? And if so, what do you look for in a player to join the Do family? I really look for unique style and flow. What I really don't like is chuggle, chuggle, chuggle something. Mm -hmm. I really don't like it, but that's my personal thing, you know? Mm -hmm. But also like this whole brand is my personal thing, so. Oh, totally. Um, you get that choice. That's your company, your brand, yeah, yeah, your yeah, yeah. That's you, man. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. So, Sorry, go ahead. So basically, if if you want to be a part of Origins, you have to have style, you have to have flow, and you kind of have to to have this mindset to 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 understand you are able to hit everything like trick wise um, on smaller cups as well. I think, mm. I personally think that my cups are big enough, you know? Mm -hmm. you, you don't think that, yeah, and I, and I agree. I think that there's this mindset that people, and, it's, and you see it in Kanama manufacturing now. It's like, let's just keep making bigger cups so that people can land the tricks that they want to land. Yeah. It's like, well, wait, if you learn to land that stuff on a smaller cup or you, you practice on a, on a shorter string, the moment that you actually play on one of those, you're going to say, oh, I don't even need this. I'm, I'm good enough to not do it. I remember there was a day recently, it was like a month ago, where uh, Takia, who you know, has been the standout player of 2020, he mm -hmm. just popped off. One of, the, one of the best players in the world right now, if not probably arguably in the top three players right now. He, I think so as well, yeah. He, yeah, I, I think he's amazing. And he, he went on his story for like an hour, I don't know how long it took him to film all these clips, but he took an Ozora three finger string and hit like 12 tab juggle 12 tap or what he was hitting all these like insane tricks on an Ozora. That was a three finger string basically yeah. as a, you don't need to have a good, you don't need to have a big Kanama to land big tricks. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So absolutely, man, that is so cool. And I respect that. And so do you have someone that you're, you're looking at adding? Is there going to be a new announcement coming soon? You don't need to say who, but I'm curious is there someone that's being added to the team right now that we should get ready for? There is, there is no announcement planned. Okay. I, got, uh, I mean, I mean, there are some announcement planned, but these are not like, um, not like Kanama, like shredders, I would say. Okay. So I'm adding a few people to the team or to the family, but they bring, they bring other stuff to mm. this whole movement than just, being being shredders and and you need to have that too you need to have a well-rounded team it's about building like you said I, I like how you've actually framed it it's a family not a yeah. not necessarily this is a pro team they're all the best players in the world that are competing yeah. and winning all these no it's a family you're building a community you're building a culture and that's that's a really good way of taking an approach to building your brand. And I like that. And I think that's a really admirable way to do it. And I think more companies need to look, more companies need to look at it that way, because I think we dismiss so many opportunities with these great individuals that could make great players for your family, but maybe yeah. aren't necessarily the people for your team. If you were to put them on a team. It's like, it's like always this, this flow team and the pro team. Yeah. It puts, it puts the people in like shelves, I think. I, th yeah, I agree. We are all together. We may be not the best players. And, and I don't know if, if, if someone deserves a pro status more than anyone else. It doesn't really matter to me. And, and I think that's so smart. Do, do, you, do you ever intend on doing like pro mods or anything like that? Like player mods? Is that something that you're thinking about doing? There is. There is a pro model. If, like I'm... Um, we're planning this pro model for so long and we, okay. we,
we are we are in this discussion all the time sure uh, but it's basically just me trying to to convince this guy to go a different way but it's not happening okay and right. and i kind of respect that but i think it's only a matter of time that mr flocks deserves his pro model oh totally but, but his his vision of his pro model is something completely different than what you would expect okay i'm excited that is exciting yeah. to to hear and and we will it's actually we will... it's actually pretty funny because i have to laugh all the time when when this idea comes to my mind because it's it's just funny but it 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 will be it will be the exact kanama that mr flox likes to play all the time yeah something that fits his playstyle for sure yeah you know it's going to be unique uh, cuz his playstyle is so unique and i'm i'm looking forward to that absolutely I mean, i mean i mean it's not really unique because it's what we started with basically yeah. it's just what he is it's it's who he is it's, yeah yeah absolutely that's that's the do vibe <laughs> and and that's the thing that I've always noticed about your players and and I I forgot who they were until you announced it but I I, re I can recognize all the names and their playstyles are also unique and I think what I like about your family that you've created is there's this culture of humility is that none of the players on your team uh, seem to care about being you know like famous or care about the clout or looking like they're the best they're just playing the game they love playing yeah. their style they're not allowing everybody else to push them into a different direction they're just playing the way they want to play and it's so beautiful to see that they just are living the game of kendama out the way that they want to live the game of kendama out yeah definitely so i respect that so i think if if i were to ever see someone you know join the do team they would have to fit that mold as well where they're they're not allowing other people to tell them how to play they're playing kendama the way that they want to play it and they're humble about it they're not trying yeah. to chase clout they're just doing it absolutely man that is so cool okay we're going to wrap up here in a quick second but i want to know uh real briefly um what is the future of do in the next two or three years what does that look like for you guys and uh if if you were to play for another company if you were to try and join another team or work collab with a company what company would you want to collab with collaborate with yeah uh, i would really like to collaborate with with sweets kenamas uh, 3 years ago 3 3 years ago yeah you you wanted to collab with them 3 years ago why why 3 years no, ago no 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 i want to collaborate with sweets kenama 3 years ago like you take sweets kenama 3 years ago like that state of, of of producing products and and everything and i just want to collaborate with them that but time. but 3 years ago you would have wanted to collab but not today why not today i mean um it's it's all about the hand painted stuff now right um at the origins and i don't really see anything hand painted from sweets canvas in the last one and a half years or two years right so you would have I wanted mean, to work with their old cushion clear paint and stuff uh i if he, if i would have to drop a name it would be Shane Leo because he was the man who did everything at sweets canvas right. when it came to hand painted canvas that's cool. But I think he left the company or he found another job or something. Right. So this part is really what I'm missing in Sweets Canamas because that's what was inspiring me a lot. Right. That that's where you drew a lot of your inspiration from. That's yeah. cool. Do you do you do much work with any of the other European brands? Uh do you collab with them at all, run events or anything like that with Native or Kenoma France or uh like Chrome? Those are the major ones that I can think of. Yeah. I mean, I work with Native Kanama pretty closely. Sometimes we create collabs. We we also did this first collaboration we did was was actually was mind blowing because I, I I went to France. I went to Lyon. I went to their place for I don't know the third time or something like that. And we agreed on doing um, producing a Kanama with French wood, but manufactured in Austria. That's cool. So what we did is we got all those wood planks for turning the Cerrado into can. Mm -hmm. And I actually put all my clothes out of my suitcase and put them in my backpack and I filled up the whole suitcase. The with suitcase wood of wood. Planks. 
to turn these, I don't know, 40 cans or something like that. So first off, my suitcase was heavy and I was illegal at the airport because I was having these sharp uh, wood planks, you know, and I traveled with them from France to Vienna. And then I went home and we produced uh, the French wood in Austria. That was the authentic collaboration. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. That's awesome. Yeah. So that that's a really cool collab. I we're gonna learn more about Nativ Kanama next week. We have uh, Tim Tim on the on the show, so we're we're gonna Very dive nice. into the French story. We're getting a lot of European uh, influence on on the review recently, and I love it uh, a lot. Uh, I think you guys have such cool stories and backgrounds to Kanama that's so different than North America, and and you know the the storytelling aspect of the European scene is so unique compared to America. Is that there's all of this origin. There's like history. There's a development. There's there's like I don't know, it's just so cool and it feels so like distant to me and I just wanna be there. I wanna be where you guys are at, being in the Kendama France edits. I wanna I wanna live the life that you guys are living for a season and I think it's just so beautiful. Definitely. I think there is something about the European Kendama scene that's just it's just um nowhere in this world. I mean, I have been to Japan and all those international um mm -hmm. That international community was also very, very welcoming, and everyone was pretty, pretty nice to talk to and stuff. But this thing we have here in Europe is kind of unique. Yeah, it is, and I'm hoping to be out there sometime next year. I want to do a trip. I want to, I want to visit everybody and and spend a spend a month out in Europe, just playing Dama with people, traveling, hitting up all the places, go do parkour with Ben Conte. Go hang out yes. with the Kendama France team. Come to Austria. Hang out at the shop. But play. I, do, I want to do it all. I just want that to be there. Like Go to the Netherlands and hang out with Alex. Come on, like who doesn't want all this? So I mean, I mean, Alex was was or is one of the coolest guys I have. The ever coolest. Met. It has been. It has been. Um, it was my first Kendama event in Rotterdam. In it was Spike Dama. Uh, it. It is being organized by one of my greatest friends, Leonard. And I was there. It, it was my first Kendama event. And we were having a break. And I went outside. And there was this big guy, this, this Cam Alex guy, you know. And I was, like, looking up to him. And he tapped me on the shoulder. And I said, hi, I'm Alex. What's your name? And that was something really, really special to me, you know. Yeah. Oh, man. He's a beauty. And I could tell stories about him as well from when I met him at MKO. I've told him a yeah. little bit on, on the, the show as well. He's a genuine guy. I hope to get him on the show eventually as well. I know he's been a listener too. And I just appreciate the man's love for Kanama and what he does for the community. But with that said, uh, we got to wrap this up here. We're about to hit that two hour mark. We've been running for a while here. And, and already? It, I know it's crazy. It goes by so fast. <laughs> And it, dude, admittedly, I, I've drank like half my water. This is my second cup of coffee. Dude, I need to go use the bathroom so bad right now. So with that said, we're going to wrap it up here real quick. But before we do, uh, Eric, is there any words that you would like to share to the community? I always like to, to kind of leave, leave the last you know, words of content uh, with you. And then I'll, I'll you know, preview the next week's episode. I mean, I mean, I want to get a big thank you out to every single human on this planet that that made its way to my website and to order a canal for me because it just means so much to me because I was working on this project so hard and it like every single order it just matters to me and it just makes me feel good and makes me want to go on and continue and make the quality even better and just deliver things that are unique for every single person out there. And don't stop. Don't ever stop doing <laughs> that. Prioritize that. Uh, not every company is doing that right now. And, and I think it's beautiful. Keep it up. Well, with that said, thank you so much, Eric, for jumping on here. Thank you for being the influence you are in the Kanama community. Thank you for the work that you've done in developing a brand that really cares about the origin of where everything comes from, uh, for working with people that are incredible uh, players that have now had a platform because of you to play Kanama and grow their voice and grow the Da'o face and brand of Da'o with the family. I think it's beautiful. I think it's really cool, man. I think people that are listening to this now are going to realize how much they've been missing out on Da'o. Uh, the shape is amazing. What you're doing is amazing. And just big props to you. 18 years old, starting a company with 10 grand out of your own bank account is insane. Uh, that is that is some big stuff uh, and huge props. Honestly, I can't wait to come meet you in person, come sesh with you, jam with you. 
that's all on the all on the sketch for the next year or two. So, Eric, thank you so much. And like I said, next week we got Timothy joining the review to chat about Kendama France, and I, we're going to do a deep dive into their edit. Uh, stay on your tablet and we're going to be diving deep into that movie because i think it's one of the greatest edits that's come out in the past year of kendama and i want to deep dive into it so guys we will see you next week and stay caffeinated eric thanks for being here thank you very much for having me stay safe everyone absolutely bye guys bye